This is Dune Talk, a DuneNewsNet.com production. Join us now for the latest Dune news, reactions, and lively discussions. Hello, Dune Nation. We're so close. In two weekends from now, there will be the first fan-first screenings of Dune Part 2 on IMAX before the movie's wider theatrical releases starting on February 28th in international territories. This is Marcus, editor at DuneNewsNet.com, and today the Dune Talk crew is diving for new insights from past week's features and interviews. Hey everyone, glad to be back on the show. Johnny Stavchek here. Uh, a lot of just Dune footage, Dune articles. It's just uh, the most fun time uh, of the movie release. We're, we're getting all the promotion and it's going to be a fun couple of weeks as uh, Marcus pointed out. So I'm excited to have Rachel on the show today and get more into the footage and this total film article. There's a lot of good uh, information here. Hi everyone, uh, Rachel here. I am very excited to be back and talking about all of these articles. Uh, very exciting time to be a Dune fan right now. Let's get into it. Hey everyone, Simon Doughty here. Uh, less than two weeks. Every time I open social media, there's something about Dune now. And thank the maker and his water for that. Awesome. It's time to talk Dune Part 2 updates. Dune Movie News. Last weekend, the embargo lifted on the press junket, and this past Tuesday, uh, there was a premiere in Mexico City with all the cast. So there's been basically a lot of press and fans uh, have seen the movie, and as a result, there's a lot of uh, new interviews uh, that we'll be discussing in the coming weeks, uh, as well as some huge spoilers out there as well. Uh, we won't be getting into major spoilers today, but we may have a dedicated episode later to discuss uh, some of those. So just let us know if you want to want to see all of that. So uh, moving on, on Wednesday, uh, Fandango and Rotten Tomatoes streamed an exclusive Dune Part 2 sneak peek preview online. And this uh, included the full scene of Paul riding the sandworm uh, for the first time, as was previously shown at the Dune IMAX reissue event, as well as uh, parts of the scissor reels. Uh, Rachel, I'm sure the experience will be uh, far more immersive when you see this on IMAX, but what was your <laughs> react scene itself? Yeah, so that was the first time I got to see it because, as I've said in other episodes, I didn't get to go to the fan events that had the preview. Uh, one, I thought it was amazing that that was the scene that was chosen um, just because that was also the first preview scene that I got to see for part one because they showed us the the first um, the first sandworm scene. So now we get to another, another sandworm scene and it's obviously a really important part. Um, I watched it like five times in a row. It was awesome. Um, I was just like walking around my apartment, just kind of like talking it out, like, you know, telling my partner, like, you know, this is so amazing because, you know, in the book, there's a lot of time spent on like, how do they get up on the worm? And, you know, I think I've probably spent a hundred hours thinking about how I would get up on the worm. So to see it done and it, it's both difficult and awe-inspiring, um, it, was, it was just amazing. It's like, Denise just like in our minds, just like pulling that stuff out and putting it on screen for us. And yeah, I definitely can't wait until it's like five stories tall in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just chime in real quick. I know we talked about this sequence when we got the opportunity to see it um, in IMAX uh, a couple of weeks ago now. And we had a lot of good things to say about it, of course. Um, getting to see it again, even just on my iPhone. Um, I've watched it several times as well. Uh, getting to see it in nice quality. Uh, and yeah, it's it's pretty much perfect. Um, trust me, Rachel, when you do get to see it in IMAX, it will blow your mind like over 10 times over and you'll probably cry. Um, and the one, <laughs> I, the one I got emotional already. Just sound like, you know. yeah, the one thing I will say about it is well, it's two things watching it on your phone or watching it on your computer at home. Obviously, you're missing out on the size that's, you know, 50 foot screen or whatever the case may be, which doesn't get, it gives you more of the scale. But the biggest thing I noticed watching on my phone, even with my ear, earbuds in is the sound you should still listen and hear some great sound but having it in the theater like is a physical experience and i felt when i was watching it the first time in in imax it was like i like i was in the middle of like a hurricane was the feeling that it that i had and it was just so cool um and i think fans you know some may be worried like oh it's like too spoilery or like i don't want to see too much or like I, i'm gonna ruin like the experience and i honestly don't think you, you will have it ruined i really think that it stands on its own like when you see an IMAX, whether you're watching Dune Part 1 again for the 10th time, you're going to see an IMAX, or if you're watching Part 2 and it comes out and you see that sequence again, I just think it's like watching it for the first time. Like it has a totally different impact seeing it that way. So 
Um, I was grateful for them to release it just because I can rewatch it and take it apart um, and hype it up. But yeah, I think I, I like that fans, if you wanted to see it, you got if you miss it the first time around, that they're getting a chance to check it out early if they want to. Yeah, seeing it in IMAX is a whole different experience. I remember when we talked about it, I hate using the word immersive, but it felt so immersive. You felt the wind, you felt everything. The sound design in IMAX is just absolutely gorgeous. And still, one part that gets to me is when you hear, when you see Paul starting to get up and the music just kicks in. It's almost like the Ganja Bar scene in the first film where Joe Walker comes in and like told Denis, like, hey man, we need to add the music right here. It's just, it's a masterpiece. And just wait until you see it in full like IMAX, you know, glory. I got, I was lucky. I was on the, I was waiting. I was like, come on, come on, see what it is. And halfway through waiting, I was like, they're going to show the sandworm again. It's not spoiling anything, people. You know, Paul writes a sandworm, but it's, <laughs> but Marcus and Johnny, did you feel like that scene was a little bit shorter than what we saw in the theater? It's funny you mention that because I, I swore that I was seeing. Uh, shots in the release footage today that I don't remember seeing the first time. Of course, we only saw it the once uh, in theaters. I'd have to go back and really think about it, but um, I don't know. Maybe maybe certain things were switched around. We know overall the preview they released today was shorter because they left out certain other shots and interview clips and other elements um, that were, I guess, exclusive to, to theater. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's a good point, Simon. Um, obviously, I, we won't really know how the whole sequence plays out for sure until we see the movie, but um, yeah, there might be some slight differences potentially. I was going to ask if you had seen maybe a couple shots or, you know, anything on, in the other version, uh, because it did feel like there was ample time in the way that it was cut to, to mm -hmm. cut other things, especially uh, the shots of, of Stilgar and the rest of the Fremen, like if they were having another discussion or if Chani had said anything that that could easily have been taken out. So mm -hmm. there yeah. Yes, there definitely. Thank you for saying that, Rachel, because there is definitely, correct me if I'm wrong, because I only watched it half a dozen times, but I don't think, did they call him Usul in, in the... They said Muad'Dib, I noted that. Okay, because they said yeah. Usul in the IMAX preview, but I don't think it's, okay. I don't think it's because in the Because I thought in one of the articles that we had read for another, yeah. another episode that they specifically called out the fact that they were calling him yes. Usul. He says it uh, yeah. very early in the clip, and ever I think all of us in the theater watching were like, "Oh my god!" Like, you know, no. um, so yeah, I remember missing. Yeah, I remember Stilgar going, "Uso," and I okay. hear that today. He said Muad'Dib, or at least it. Yeah, I think Shashakli at least did. Yeah, somebody said something. Someone did. Somebody said Muad'Dib. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, because I was like, "Oh, I thought they were going to call him Uso. Why would they call him that? He's not Muad'Dib. Yeah, he hasn't ridden a worm." Um, yeah, so I, I think I, I also want to go back to just what you said about the sound design, because the sound design of, of Dune Part 1 is what won me over to this version of Dune, um, going in as a very skeptical fan who has, you know, endured many, <laughs> many adaptations um, and been, you know, happy but disappointed. You know, I, the sound design of, of Part 1 was exactly what I wanted, like, as soon as it began with the stumper noise and mm. the frisian of <laughs> sand. And it, it's happened again, right? With this IMAX preview of, of just like the absolute silence when they're speaking and then the thumper and just the, the lovely detail of like including the drum sand, you know, that wasn't necessary. Yeah. You could have just walked out and put the thumper down. <laughs> like we would have still been impressed by the worm, but you know, they, they spent that time to be like, Oh, there's, there's different kinds of sand. <laughs> So that was all just so it's just it's you can tell you are watching something made by a true fan who loves the source material so much. Really exciting. And one of the things that I'll just mention real quick also is talking about the sound and just the little details and things that in the, the drum sand tying that directly back to the first movie because they make a point of saying drum sand right. um, and hearing that same sound effect. There's the same sound effect where in this preview we got today. You can hear and like vaguely see the worm at a great distance coming and you can see it kind of like, you know, kicking up sand and then it stops almost or seems to stop. And then there's that kind of hissing sound 
that pops up on, in a different area. Um, and we get, you get that same image and that same sound effect when it shows up during the harvester sequence in the first movie. And I think maybe during the other sequence towards the end of part one, but yeah, it's just, I love seeing that in part two, cause it just, there's that language that's already established and you get that consistency and that continuity. And I, I just think that makes the world so much more believable. And, and to Rachel's point, I just think for part one, it was such a strong as strong as the visuals were which of course they were incredible right like the sound is so important to the texture and the specificity of the world that he did that he made you know even in direct con uh, contrast to something like david lynch's adaptation or you know the miniseries for example just kind of idly looking on the internet how do i can i do like imax in my house <laughs> <laughs> not affordable uh even for someone like me but <laughs> it was really i was just like yeah like maybe that's something i uh, you know five minutes of googling later like, oh, <laughs> how, how could i ever how can i live the rest of my life knowing that like if i don't get to see it in imax it won't be the same it really yeah. is worth it i know it's like you sound like we're in a cult but it really does <laughs> it really is worth it it, it really does i, I do want to ask to get opinions here um at least from marcus and simon because they saw the first reissue I know it was said online for this Tenet reissue they did in the last like week or so um, that they did not show this clip. They showed a different clip, which was, I guess, a, a Spice Harvester uh, attack sequence. And so I'm curious with the reissue this weekend, which I'm also going to, my, me and my whole family are going to go see it. Um, I'm very like, I'm curious, like, I don't know if I want to see more or if I'd be like disappointed if it is the worm scene again, even though it would be really cool to see it again in IMAX early. So. I'm I'm curious. I think it would be kind of cool to do something different just so that different audiences, like maybe people that didn't go the first time get something different or vice versa. Um, or maybe they'll just stick with it, even though it's online now. I don't, I don't know. Um, it'll be interesting. I think they're going to show the sandworm. Like I said on previous shows, people know Dune, think Dune, sandworms. Worms. So, yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. that's, that's probably a fair bet, I would say. But, you know, Oh, back. <laughs> Getting into our main story for today, um, as is the tradition with movies like Dune, there are in-depth features published in major movie magazines. And last fall, we got the Dune Part 2 cover story on Emperor Magazine. And then now, uh, due to the wait for the delay, it's finally the turn from a total film. Uh, and they've released an, uh, a feature um, in their magazine from, from February. So speaking of the sandworm writing sequence that we just uh, talked about, uh, the magazine offered some interesting uh, insights, including from uh, VFX supervisor Paul Lambert. Uh, Johnny, what are your thoughts on the massive efforts that went on behind the scenes to realize this sequence? Yeah, I mean, talking about massive <laughs> efforts, I mean, nothing surprises me anymore with Villeneuve's films, and especially Paul Lambert. <laughs> He's pretty much like a living legend, and he just became a legend in like the last five years because he won three straight Oscars. Um, and you know, he did Blade Runner 2049. He did, uh, Damien Chazelle's first man, which I, I love. I think it's a great movie. And of course he did Dune. Um, and just getting to hear a little bit more detail. I mean, that's one of my favorite things I always look forward to with these types of movies of, of any scale and, and any genre really, but it's of course with Dune in particular and Villeneuve at the helm. I, I always love hearing about the different techniques they use, the technology that they use to get certain shots or, or sequences. Um, and this scene in particular, the Paul's first ride, I think, you know, that's one where you're, you're just wondering, or we've been wondering for a couple of years now, like, how are they going to do it? Like, how are they going to pull it off? So it looks and feels real, feels right, true to the book, but also, you know, appropriate for, you know, uh, audiences to believe and feel like that it, it looks right. Um, and so getting to hear how, you know, when they, he says in the article that in their very first like zoom meeting for part two, they're like, how the hell are we going to do the worm riding? like sequence is like, how are we going to do the worms? Like we created the worms in part one. We got to see them and their size and the design and everything, but putting people on them and riding them is just a whole different thing. And that's going to, that's going to be a prominent part of part two as, as book readers will know. And as we've seen in the marketing so far, um, and we had some ideas, maybe some, some suspicions, but just the way they broke it down into these different, it's such a layered process, the way they describe it. Um, talking about how they they designed and built a slab of worm um and basically brought it out into the desert and in addition to that for the actual so that's part of the writing sequence but then to get on the worm 
there's the element of the dune collapsing and Vilna basically saying, um, you know, to make sure that it just makes sense, uh, visually speaking, that he wanted to like have the worm come through a dune, um, and for it to just basically break up so that the rider can fall on top of it and kind of climb up. Um, I thought that was just such a, a really interesting way of kind of like breaking, breaking it down into steps. And then the way that they did that in, in the desert was building a dune with just in a controlled area. They gathered a bunch of sand, like a ton of sand, literally a metric ton <laughs> and, uh, built it up. And then they, the special effects team, uh, which is headed by Gurf Nefser, uh, they put in these huge tubes inside this artificial dune. And then they, with these industrial grade tractors, they pull out the tubes to collapse the sand down. And they have a stunt team going and they have a performer on top. And I'm sure there's wires and whatnot involved. They didn't get to all the details, but um, you can see that in the, in, the pre in the preview. Like it's very much like you can understand the, the logic of it. Um, and that there is like, it feels like there is a, a, a reality there. Um, and then of course there's visual effects to help add dust and sand and, and to drop them into the worm and all these different things to tie it together. And then going back to the slab of worm, having Chalamet and the other, you know, stunt performers and whatnot get on the worm and they're like, they're like, like bucking it up and down and like, they're just bouncing it out in the desert. And while they're doing that, because they're on the desert and the sun is lighting it, Greg Frazier apparently wanted, and you can see this in the preview again, backlight. So that it basically silhouetted with the rider on the worm, um, which I think works really well, especially with the, all the dust and sand. Um, but basically they were, they were rotating the slab of worms so that as the sun's moving, that they have the, the sun behind the performer. So, and then again, there's VFX to expand the worm and to add dunes and other parts of the desert, um, in the background. And it's just, it's wild. I can't wait to see some more behind the scenes photos and, um, you know, different different elements that actually show them doing this stuff because it sounds really cool. It sounds really difficult as well. Um, just very imaginative. So I, I would say they succeeded. I think we can all agree on that, but wow, just the amount of like thought and effort involved. I, it just, all that stuff is just, that, that's one little you know, part of the sequence uh, in the movie. Um, and so it just makes you appreciate all the work that goes into every, it's a two and almost three hour movie. Um, and all the different effects and stunts and things like that that they have to come up with. It's just mind blowing. But um, I, that, that part of the article really stood out to me because it, it was really getting to the nitty gritty, like technical elements that I like kind of nerd out over. Absolutely. It goes back to, uh, you know, growing up with uh, the extended edition of Lord of the Rings, right? Where they start, they made all of those people that made the movie, the real rock stars. Um, I'm thinking of all the practical effects that they did for Fury Road, which were mm. incredible and, and so complicated. And yeah, I would absolutely love some kind of extra featurette content on how they did all of that, you know, like, because you're right, all these people that are, that are hooking tractors up to giant people, <laughs> dragging them through the desert um, and catapulting like stuntmen onto these, onto these slabs of worm, like, I, for me, like that, those are the people that I want to recognize on the street. <laughs> yeah. Like those are the people that really like thought about it and made it real. Uh, and the, and the dedication to like the practical effects, um, I think is really special and is going to keep, keep this film working incredible forever. I think we'll probably get a special feature on the home release. We have to, and I agree with Johnny. I, I want to see like behind the scenes photos of it. You know, I remember when the Lord of the Rings extended cut came out, I actually watched all the special features on them. Like, that's a lot of special features. <laughs> I was like, well, I don't need to go to film school. I have learned so much already <laughs> from, like, how they make films just from it. But you're right, Rachel. Those are the on, um, unseen heroes. We yeah. talk about the actors. We talk about, like, the directors. And we nerd out over people like Greg Frazier. You know, Joe Walker. Justifiably so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I would love to go up to Joe Walker and be like, man, thank you so much for editing, Dune. You did an amazing job. But it's, it's the people that work behind the scenes. And how do you even come up with the idea, let's pull a truck to, like, <laughs> like where does that come from? Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful team. Like, when people are like, oh, that was a great film. You got to think that 
it assembles this team, not just the actors and the actresses, but it's everyone behind the scenes. So anyone that's working behind the scenes on any film or any TV production or anything, thank you so much for making our fantasies come true. <laughs> and like our dreams, like, yeah. When uh, Dune Part 2 was greenlit uh, back in October 2021, uh, the Denis Villeneuve sent uh, Timothy Chalamet the message, more deep time. Uh, this refers to how in Part 1, Villeneuve had to remind Chalamet several times that he was playing that noble boy from Caladan and not yet that leader or the, the prophet that he'll become later in the story. Uh, Ra Rachel, what goes through your head uh, reading about the transformation that lies ahead for Paul in the second movie? For me, it's really important to kind of understand like where they're coming from when they're cut, when they're making the story and not, you know, not just not just how an actor prepares for the role, but how the role is explained to the actor. Right. And the, this idea that there is a distinct, different person in Muadi, you know, that he's becoming um, and then he, it, for part one, it's not him yet. Right. You're still you're still you're still Paul. Um, and then he gets that kind of like bat signal of like blah, deep time. It's just it, to me, it shows like a fundamental understanding of the story in a way that I have never seen adapted for public consumption. So it's really exciting for me to think, oh, my gosh, like these these people get it. Um, and I also kind of gives me a hint that like this next part, two is really going to be focused on that transformation of Paul into this 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 figure right he's not even really a person and and to even reference the 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 shot of the war writing that we talked about earlier in this episode it's like that is the moment where he kind of becomes this figure that the fremen idolize he's not you know like silgar stops being his friend in that moment and becomes his follower right so that I don't know. I just love that idea that we're going to get something so strong, like from such a strong point of view of that transformation. And it maybe not all being good, right? It's not just a simple hero story. So my question is, when they greenlit uh, Dune Messiah, is Denis going to text uh, Timothy with Jihad prophet time? Prophet time, yeah. Jihad time, pro prophet time. I don't know. <laughs> I wonder if it autocorrect to morphin time a couple morphin, of times. Morbin time. You know, I, I, here's the thing. I know that they're all like being very coy about part three, but, and I know that even Denise said in this article, like, I just wanted to be at peace with like each part that I made. But for me, like part three has, it's, it's, it seems like the point of all of this. Um, I can't imagine that we won't, that we won't get it. Part three is happening, people. <laughs> like i said yeah. last show yeah as like the weekend after it opens it'll be like dude part three coming out soon i do want them to wait a while before they film it i know denise talking about other films i want a good five six years to have our characters age as they do um i also had this theory last night because i can't sleep and my brain just goes everywhere <laughs> And I think about Dune too much. Um, this might be a major spoiler, but at the end of the movie, so the stuff with Aralon happens, right? I'll say that much. But I want a shot if we zoom into Paul and Paul has visions of like the jihad and all that that we'll probably see in Messiah. And then it just fades to black like, what is going on? Like, I want people to be kind of like disturbed and not really be like, oh, Paul Atreides was our hero this whole entire time. Like, I want that. Ways I think that the chances up. are high because like Denise been in interviews saying like Paul is an antihero. Paul is a is a dark figure. You know, I, I think he's not. I don't think we're getting a, a, a film that's like the Lynch version. <laughs> so no water version of like yeah i'm just like you know toto and rain and happiness and like you know <laughs> yeah i mean i think uh i agree with rachel there i've been watching a lot of these in interviews because <clears throat> i'm just such a sucker uh and the vibe is definitely like 
I don't. I think they're trying to avoid saying like, yeah, this movie is like kind of a downer at the end. But <laughs> and that's it's the a story. tragic ending. That's yes, really tragic. Yeah. That's that's yeah. a good point. Yes, they have said tragic and tragedy a lot as the like the culmination of the movie. So I definitely think it's gonna be an intro. I'm gonna, very interested to see how people react to it. Um, I think it's gonna be a crowd as close as to a crowd pleasing film as Dune can be ultimately. But I'm just wondering like that that kind of like denouement at the end. Like how are people gonna feel about walking out of the theater um hopefully it'll be it'll lead to good discussion or whatnot that's my hope but uh but yeah i guess we won't know until opening weekend a couple more weeks i'm so jealous of the people who have gotten to see it i know it's wild it's wild wild. there's like a thousand people that are like not press not critics just fans that have like saw it yesterday like that's just uh that's wild it's cool though i'm glad i'm glad they're really spreading the love because i think that's that's what uh, it's all about so and uh, Total Film also offered more insights into Fate's arena fights. Um, and we also got that confirmation we were talking about, I think also one of the previous episodes. Uh, the black and white color that we see in the arena is actually the natural phenomenon from the light of Giddy Prime's uh, star. Uh, Simon, what are the key takeaways from, from you from the whole uh, arena fight and lighting? Well, I, my first reaction was like, cool, it makes sense. And I remember Johnny, oh, geez, uh, when the first trailer had, so maybe six, seven months ago, of being like, this could be the lighting on Giddy Prime. Um, I thought it was interesting. I thought Austin Butler shaved his head. Apparently it's not. It's a ball cap. I love the arena, what we're getting out of it. And I'm happy that we're getting to see more of Giddy Prime. And in the feature that came out today of um, the IMAX sizzle reel, I did notice this, what I thought was, you know, bombs or something blowing up Giddy Prime, but it's actually fireworks. Like you said, Johnny, it's them celebrating Faye, beautiful Faye Rafa. And I have a theory. I'm curious to know what you guys think. Okay. So, of course, I have to bring up Olio because, you know, <laughs> we're like 20 minutes into this show. I haven't said Aaliyah yet. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to hear Aaliyah again until the movie comes. <laughs> no, 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 hear me out. Hear me out. We know that, and they make it very clear that Faye is power hungry in every interview and in this article that he really wants to take down the Baron. What if Faye kills the Baron to take, to have the upper hand rage just hear me out okay (laughs) hear me out i think that you're probably on to something i don't want to i'm trying not to say that until i have to like dear uncle i love you and all but like "Mm." like (laughs) stab to the back like Mm -hmm. and then he becomes in charge of house or corner faster than we think and then Mm. fights paul and that's the end of that but still i think Looking at that scene that we talked about that was in the Florence Pugh making of last week. And I could be wrong. Olia might do it or someone else. But I have a feeling that Faye will probably be the end of the Baron. Because they're really wow. pushing like he's very yeah. power hungry. He's very power hungry. He's not afraid to kill. It's a bold, bold prediction, Simon. I will say, <clears throat> I don't know if I mean, it's not a bad idea in terms of like it making sense. Like I could see it happening. Um, I am super curious to see how they end up performing that part of the story because I hate to say it for maybe some of the you know at more avid book fans among us, but I'm I don't think the odds are looking good for uh, Saint Alia of the Knife to no. to be killing the Baron. I think it's going to be probably someone else, um, and I think. At, Fade, Paul, Jessica, Johnny, any number of those people are probably ahead of her at this point. So it, it, I think it's fun, though. I mean, to me, I, I'm not like super honed in on that point. I think I, I'm just curious and trying to keep an open mind because I think there's a lot of interesting angles they could take with that potentially. Um, you know, there's a lot of question marks around that character, obviously, in general. So, uh, but Simon, I like I like your your thinking in terms of already going that direction um i will say though to to the point of the scene and and what you were saying about 
the lighting and whatnot and the colors. It's wild now. Like that was last May, I think. Um almost a year ago basically and yeah i remember i was talking about that and, like theorizing like what could it mean what could it be um and it's cool that they ended up sticking with that and like his specific quote talking about you know the laws of physics and what it would be like in a different galaxy or part of the universe where instead of you know the sun or a star providing light or color excuse me um basically it, like makes it devoid of color and i think that's like that's the type of sci-fi stuff like that just really I, I wish we saw more of that in, like big uh movies like mainstream and big budget movies just because it's like really just fun like concepts like outside the box for you know specific reasons and like there's a thematic purpose to it and uh and on, on top of it being an aesthetic choice so um I just like that he has that little justification and you know he ties it into you know how Dune is about you know the, the laws of nature and ecology and the environment all these different things and obviously the harkonnens are a product of their environment as you can tell so um yeah i, th I think it was cool to get that confirmation and then also them talking about filming it i thought was really neat um and just it sounded kind of brutal like it was like over 100 degrees and they're like in a microwave because it's like these big black like walls and it's like sand everywhere um so it's just it sounded like it was a really tough uh, situation but yeah they said um, that people passed out like people in the crew yeah like heat poisoning or yeah no it's uh i believe it yeah no it, it i would again that's another thing like i can't wait to see some footage uh, and, and and images of them actually filming that because i think it, it, it just sounds like a, a pre-try situation but uh the more and that was the first part. scene that they filmed right yeah i believe they said yeah right and that's a bad <laughs> move just going nope we're doing it in black and white and we're not shooting this in color and we can't fix it it doesn't look mm -hmm. good because how much <laughs> money are they spending for each setup and being like this is a giant risk like and yeah. thank god warner brothers was like okay Denis, we trust you go for it because they could have been easily like you know what shoot in color fix in post <laughs> if it doesn't yeah. work yeah yeah the infrared i mean i guess we haven't even really gotten to that but just like it's not just black and white like it's infrared which is it offers a totally different tonality to the images and different values and whatnot i think it just looks it, i mean we saw that back in the trailer when it first came out in may i mean it was a very stark distinct image um and i think it just looks great i think it's just so suitable and he, as he said in the article you know it's very eerie um and, and offers something like different than just a, even black and white would um which i think is great and austin butler was talking about how it makes your eyes look a little bit different things like that so um just a lot of different like little odds and ends to that point but um yeah they started filming in july i think um so it was the dead of summer and i remember it's i wish i had said this like gone on the record at some point on the show or twitter or something but i remember seeing like when they started filming on the first day they posted a picture of the clapperboard and it was like on like this like white sand looking like like floor background i was like i bet they're shooting the gladiator scene like i bet that's the first thing like they're knocking out um and i i remember thinking that when i saw that and then lo and behold like almost two years later they're like yeah that was the first thing so it is cool to like like you said Simon, for them to just jump right into something so intense and daring in terms of you know the choices they were making yeah it's clearly like a lot of dedicated people were involved in the making of making of this movie then we had the um uh sandstruck romance that section of the the feature article which uh discusses a chinese character and she has a greatly expanded role in the movie and she faces the struggle of, uh she loves paul as a person but at the same time, she doesn't believe in the prophecy surrounding him. And there was a nice quote from uh, Zendaya there. Uh, in the book, uh, Chani meets Paul and uh, is like, all right, uh, this is the guy I support you. Whereas in our film, in no way does she bend how she feels. She's strong in her convictions. Even when she's falling in love, she still doesn't like what Paul represents. Uh, Simon, I know we've already had some really in-depth discussion about uh, Chani in past episodes and how she's different character in the movie versus the book. Uh, based on these latest comments, what are your thoughts on the dynamic of this inner struggle she's facing? I love it. I mean, Chani in the book is very much like, oh, Paul, I love you. You're great. Thank you for saving us in a weird way. But this new version of Chani, and like I said on the previous podcast, we're fans of the book. We're fans of the source material, but we don't want to copy and paste again. So if we expand on Chani's personality, and what she believes in, because Chani's badass, okay? Let's face it. 
she's one of the coolest characters when she's ran the right way. And what's interesting when you're saying that she loves, she's falling in love with Paul. If you watch some of the trailers and TV spot, she's like, I will always love you if you stay the man you are. So she's afraid of the prophet. She, she knows his nightmares or his visions because she's right there along with him. And I think Chani is not one of these friends that's like, oh, they're going to come and rescue us and everything's going to be great. You know, even from the first scene in the first part of the first movie, she's like, who are our next oppressors? And she she's afraid that the man that she's falling in love with is becoming that next oppressor. So I think it's great that they're expanding on the Chani character, the Irulan character. You know, Denis is very female first, and I love that, especially in Dune. It's so crucial. And I remember when... They were talking early on. I don't even think they started production yet. When Denis was like, well, Chani's going to ha- be a bigger part. And people were upset on the internet. I don't know if you you Poor remember. <laughs> right? This is before part like, one came out. Yeah. Was it before yeah. part one yeah. came out? Like, they're like, oh, oh. she's going to ruin the movie, blah, blah, blah. No, but you need that role. Like, I think. I'm curious at the turning point where she actually believes that Paul is the prophet and is Maudid because it looks like she cares and falls in love with Paul, but there's that struggle of Paul's also acting up and slowly by slowly by the end of the movie is full on, you know, quiz at Hazarat mode. So it'll be interesting to see Zendaya act and see her performance because first movie, gives no Fs about him. I mean, are you watching it in the movie theater? Here, have a have a crest knife. Die on early. This was my friend. Like, <laughs> she, she even tells him, she's like, you're just a little boy. Why do I care about you? You know? And it would have been so weird to see that Chani, and then the next part being head over here, the hills. Chani like, oh, Paul, you're the greatest, blah, blah. So I love that we're going to see that relationship. But in the back of her mind, it's going to be an, a struggle. Like, I love this man, but I don't love what he stands for. And I think we've all been in a relationship where we care or love about someone, but we don't, like, there's stuff about them that bothers Please us. Please don't and... murder the universe. And... <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. Don't. <clears throat> Don't murder 61 billion people. Yeah. I love you. Try. Just try. But <laughs> be good today, please. You know, I think that anyone who is afraid of Chani being expanded upon, there is nothing that, you know, Denis has said, and I absolutely agree with him, like adaptation is is destroying the thing and making it again. Um, is he making something that is true to the source material? I I think so. And, you know, Chani is the child of an imperial, you know, planetologist. She has a foot in both the Fremen culture and this this kind of the, the greater empire. She's had access to that education. She's been influenced by her parents. You know, the, it would not make any sense if she was a fervent um, follower. She has she's a leader and she, even though she's young and yeah i think that it's completely plausible that she would one fall in love with the person that she actually met right and has had a relationship with and not a, the idea of of a a prophet or a, you know the liaison i okay. so i love that i think that's just better better writing uh and secondly you know i think that it's it gives her something to do in the story besides be a a place to put pain uh which is where women often get put in 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 stories like this um so yeah i don't know i i I think i I think this is a perfectly plausible and true to her character expansion i have i don't know the details obviously because i haven't seen it but i would i this idea that she's resistant to the man she loves turning into something else um yeah Makes sense. I'm curious if they're going to bring that up, who her parent was 
in part oh, two. Oh yeah, I guess they never technically uh did they did they guess they technically didn't yeah. Well, I know. <laughs> you can't take this knowledge from me. You can't take Saint Alia from me and you can't take this knowledge from me. <laughs> oh Saint yeah. Alia. I I definitely um yeah, that will be interesting to see if they comment or go into that at all. I imagine they might. But um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's it feels great reading this and hearing this because on this show, we've talked about that like at length before. Um, like, what are they going to do with Chani? Um, and like Vilno's intent with her and just other comments he's made in the past, kind of theorizing, you know, how that relationship dynamic is going to work. And this, like, I'm just getting more and more excited to see this because it just sounds so like, juicy and dramatic like mm -hmm. i'm i love in film and you know just any narrative where it there's a relationship that is like it's there's like a toxic like element to it and like there's like this, this, there's tension. this tension there's yeah. this give and take where you really want to see them succeed but you know like there's just it feels like there's a tragic element to it like they've said right. um you can't it just that's not how life works sometimes and i think that this the way they're setting this up just sounds really really um just rich for you know good writing good character work um performances like i i just think there's gonna be a lot of great stuff between these two and i think that just having read the book you know the couple of times i have in the last few years like i wouldn't have imagined that in the movie just based on what's in the book um, and as Rachel was saying, like, that's just part of the adaptation process. And I think yeah. what they're doing is, is very intriguing to me so far. It gives them like, if, if Chani believes in Mwadi, right. If she, if she supports him 100% in, and we're watching a movie of it, it would take, it would, it just completely takes all the tension out of the scenes with, you know, the water of life scene, any, any conflict that she may have with uh, Jessica pushing that agenda, uh, you know, in, in contrast to, to her own agenda. So, you know, I think that it, it needs a place where you can insert a little bit of unknown tension, a little bit of push and pull. That's going to make it so much more dynamic for us to watch. I mean, because you're not reading it, you can't get in everyone's head. You can't spend as much time. I, I think it makes perfect sense. And I am very excited to see all of these roles expanded upon. Um, because it's not just, it's not just the Paul show. <laughs> <laughs> I think tension is a great word too. I like that because it really is like with these two characters, despite them falling in love and being a, a couple, the every act or word <laughs> that they, they make is going to be like you're going to be worried about how the other is going to react to that, um, especially with Paul, obviously. And then, you know, how Chani, you know, may push back against certain things, as we've seen even in the trailer and other footage they've released so far. There seems to be some very clear, um, you know, tension there in terms of of what she thinks and what, you know, she thinks the Fremen should do potentially and Stilgar and how he factors in as well as Jessica. Um, we saw a promotional image, not from Total Film, but over the last week where they, it was Jessica and Chani in an image and they seemed like they were not on the same page. So yeah, there's a lot of, of great stuff here. And I think the Paul Chani um, dynamic is like the nucleus of all of the drama in the story. I think it's great that we're evolving this character and you know, nothing against Frank, but he did write this in the sixties and it was a different time. I mean, I, I hate sounding like, the old man, well, back in the day, you know, <laughs> they didn't want to give female characters such an important role. Frank did in his little way, but I think evolving Chani is great because Chani plays a bigger part later in the later books. And I, I love Zendaya. I think that character of Chani is, I would watch a movie just like an origin story on Chani, how she became this Fremen that is not fierce, but is a powerful leader. And let's not forget, she's also a kid. Like when these events take place, Paul and her are barely 20, if that. So I think it's interesting. My whole entire thing, it's going to be kind of like the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde relationship. Like, I love you. Please don't kill. I love you, please. <laughs> 
d- so don't, much of what uh, Paul does later is is really rooted in how he feels about Johnny, right? It, oh, it he loves him. Johnny. He loves her over everything else. He will let the universe burn for her, right? And you know it, whether the, whether or not that is enough is is his story. How are we supposed to empathize with that if Chani is two dimensional? If Chani ha- has not proven herself as a well rounded character that deserves to be obsessed over by the most powerful man in the universe? So, I mean, you know, it makes sense to me. Without going to like spoiler territory, the end of Messiah is very much Paul having a choice about Chani and he loves her, but he doesn't want to do, but then that could change stuff well you know it's kind of like vague what i'm saying but if you read messiah you know what i'm <laughs> talking about it's just chani is this true love like there's no doubt about it and it's not some stupid high school crush like he will like you said he will burn the universe down for her so i want to see the part where she starts believing in paul the messiah the, the Mahdid, you know. You know, all together, we might have seen like 15 minutes of this movie. And it's a two hour. <laughs> and it's and like four two. hours long. So, got lost. right. And like, I, <laughs> I always feel like movies like this, you got a good 10 minutes of credits. But we have, we've even touched the surface of it, you know. Yeah, and and I, I will say, uh, in terms of the female characters, that uh, Frank Herbert always from the beginning wrote uh, Lady Jessica to be like a very deep and, uh, key character in, in the, the whole story of the, of the first novel. And this piece also highlights that Lady Jessica will still have a major part to play in Dune Part 2, um, even though like in the book, like her, her role sort of diminishes a bit towards the end. And um, yeah, Villeneuve, he emphasized that her expanded role is the biggest difference between the novel and his uh, adaptation. There's uh, one quote for him, uh, strangely, Jessica's more in the background in the second part of the novel. And I thought that was not proper. Still, uh, she's still Lady Jessica, the main architect of the story. I thought it was a very powerful idea that was not sustained in the book. I made sure that she has character presence in the second part. R- Rachel, what was your reaction to reading the comments from both the director and also Rebecca Ferguson talking about her character? I wrote down that uh, Jessica as the main architect proves to me that Denis Grock's Dune. Like, <laughs> Jessica is always and will always be my very favorite character. And, you know, everything she does and, and the, every choice she makes impacts every single thing that happens um and i it does not make sense that she would be sidelined she's a very powerful character she still has influence she still has her own story uh her own you know revenge her own love her own her own point of view and it deserves to be shown uh so yeah i I really think that's great anyhow and oh gosh ferguson is amazing i i watched all of uh silo because i've read the wool books but i I watched all that just for her because she's just you know great like just watching her is enough uh so to give her something to do and you know the costume design that they put her in is certainly really striking um and 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 i guess i I don't want to say othering but she has she has ascended beyond the lady jessica right there's something clearly right they've she's got all the glyphs on her face and and she's got all the headdresses and everything. So she is a, 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 a powerful person in this story. And we haven't seen too much of what she's going to do besides those couple clips that I know what scene those are from. <laughs> but uh, certainly, certainly so impactful that there, she can't just be there for that one MacGuffin thing that she does. And then, you know, let's go sit over there. Um, I want to see her fight and, and quarrel and move pieces around the board just like i want to see Roland do that so one thing i've seen a few different fans <clears throat> say this just in discussion online that they're like I, and i think it was even prior to this article coming out um which is why i think of it but basically there's been so much focus on paul and shawnee and especially their relationship and then of course like fade and whatnot that you know jessica was basically a co-lead in the first movie and she has such a strong important character central to the entire plot um you know, in the novel and in the first movie that people are getting a little concerned, like, is she going to like not be around as much? Like, is she not going to be, you know, she's not going to have as much of an impact or like presence. Um, And I think that this quote kind of, uh, you know, I think that kind of allows that to subside a little bit and it it definitely, you know, uh, puts emphasis on the fact that Villeneuve did not want 
her to be diminished. And, um, you know, Rebecca Ferguson is fantastic. She's so good in the first movie. She's fantastic in general. Um, and so I, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm actually glad that the marketing and, and some of the promotional material so far has not put too much emphasis on her because that just leaves more for us to explore and find out when we actually see the movie. And I think her and, you know, the child, <laughs> uh, that, that potential dynamic, uh, sounds very interesting. I think the less we know, the better so far. So wait, you're telling me Grogu isn't in this? <laughs> Grogu with a knife. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Grogu's going to get <sighs> stabbed if he shows up in this movie. Probably. <laughs> to go back to what you said, like the, yes, books from the past have, have a lot of problems or, you know, the, Frank Herbert is not a perfect person. You know, we can say a lot, a lot of negative things about him. Um, but what we can say is, that's positive is that he gave us some really incredible female characters from the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. And he certainly expanded upon them later. Um, I think knowing in hindsight what he had done, <laughs> but you know, it's nice to, to, to kind of go back to the beginning and properly expand those roles. And Jessica is, I mean, and I think you're right. I think they're keeping something close to the chest to give us something to experience, something new. And also, how are you going to sit at a press junket and explain <laughs> like 90% of what Jessica is involved with? Yeah. It's too weird. I think, you know, like, get a spring the weird stuff on people where they're an hour and a half in and they're already like invested and they believe in it and they're yes of course we're they paid for their ticket we're yep we're gonna do some stuff now get ready uh, slowly by slowly introduce the the craziness the when the club the LSD. <laughs> yeah yes. that's what the popcorn you know, buckets are for <laughs> today we are that's what they're for so are all I, the popcorn buckets i can't wait <laughs> or is anyone buying that popcorn bucket by the way i might have to honestly just just for the lols like but we'll see uh, in 20 years you're gonna find that like in your basement like oh, what that's, that's what it, why do i have this? but like you said johnny it gets people talking about doing too which not, nothing wrong with that you know what's funny is my mother-in-law went to the movies today i don't know what she wants to go see but she's got her dune 2 tickets for the 29th at 4.45 in the afternoon. So technically, if we didn't go to the screening of the fan events, she would have seen it before me. But I'm <laughs> curious to see, like, what she's going to think about it. Because she's, you know, she's a pretty reserved person. And when I'm sure she's going to talk to me about the craziness that is, like, the water of life and the other stuff. It, well, certainly the cast brings in a lot of people that maybe wouldn't necessarily be interested in watching a Dune adaptation. I remember when I went to the original like IMAX preview in 2021, it was full of people who were there to see Timothy and Zendaya. And <laughs> they had no idea what they were watching. And the reactions were amazing because <laughs> they had no idea. And the word came because it was the harvester scene and everything. And uh, it was I love that we're, we have these really great actors doing their thing, stretching their acting muscles, and people are going to go see it, whether or not they're familiar with Dune. And then they get to, you know, experience a spice orgy. It's, it's great. <laughs> uh, another thing I read or heard, I think it was in the Total Film article, that they want to make this film work by itself. Like, sure, if you saw part one, great. But you would also understand just watching part two, what's going on. And I think that's really clever of, you know, the filmmakers not to be like, sorry, you didn't see part one. Well, I guess you can't join our group. You know, I don't want this. Montage? What does that mean? Are we, are we I don't know. Like maybe like previously on Dune. I, <laughs> I don't know. But if they said that it's going to feel like you could see this movie separately. And not be stuck with just, hey, you didn't see part one, tough cookies. Princess Zero on voiceover. Yep. Yeah. I want her, her head just floating in space as she tells us. <laughs> uh, 
No, because you're going to be introduced to Princess Irlan for the first time. You're going to be introduced to Fade for the first time. So even if you haven't watched Dune Part 1, you're, you're getting that same introduction. And of course, you miss a lot of context about, you know, like what um, Paul's background is and Caledon, but you're sort of like then put into the into the action. So I, I can see what they what, what he means by that, but I certainly wouldn't recommend, you know, if you have a chance, watch Dune Part 1. But yeah, it makes sense. Like if, if you, if for some reason, that's going to be an excuse, you know, it's, you, you, you can go into the cinema probably without uh, having... Yeah, I, Erulyn will be able to catch her father up <laughs> on the events and, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, I'm sure fate has to be interrupted at his birthday party and told what's going on. So, yeah, but maybe those are the scenes where they give us the exposition. But, you know, it could also just be a random montage scene. I can't even imagine what a montage scene in, like, Denise style would be like. <laughs> Previously on do. <Dude. laughs> Uh, that'd be really funny. Yeah, we, we also got a nice interview with, with Florence Pugh about her character, uh, expanded role uh, as, as well, and the uh, relationship with the emperor and her very impressive wardrobe. Uh, so, uh, Johnny, we, we, we actually just spent a lot of time talking about Irlan on, on the last show that you weren't on, but what were your thoughts looking at Florence's comments here? Yeah, um, I, I'm bummed that I, got, I missed that discussion because that was a great clip. Um, but I, honestly, between this article... And just the other interviews I've seen with her so far, I, I really like Florence Pugh. Um, she's a great actor. And I was excited for her to be in this movie ever since she was cast. And she was one of the people I, w I was kind of hoping to see cast uh, when they were figuring out who was going to play Erlon. And I have gotten, just in the last week, so much more excited about her uh, playing this character and just the involvement of Erlon and how she's going to be factored into the story in part two. Um, because of the, some of these comments and that one clip alone, um, in the, in the total film article, she kind of talks about how this character is just very different from really anything else she's played, um, in her other roles, She's very much like talking a lot. She's very much a character who's kind of, uh, put it, kind of having to stand her ground, like argue for her own points when I, whether she's in little women or Midsommar, um, which I think are great, great roles in great movies. But here, and you can see this just in that first clip that was, that was uh, released online she is and she says this in the article she's just watching and learning and figuring out and you can see it in just that little clip in just a few seconds how she's processing everything that she's hearing and working it out and figuring out what's the next play or what's going to happen and i just I, I haven't seen her in a role like that as she pointed out and i just think it's gonna be very cool to see um i think there's just still uh, a lot of i guess mystery there because that's one of the points again that's going to be different from the book and, and her involvement just seems like it's going to be expanded and i'm, I'm excited to see that um not only because i like her as as a performer but i think just that character and especially as someone who's a big fan of messiah <clears throat> i think that they have a lot of opportunity with her and uh to set up certain things and and just to really twist the knife in certain respects i think um you know for fans of the story and for you know how she factors in with Paul and Chani and, and some of these other characters. So, um, that was really the main thing that stood out to me. And of course she talks about working with Christopher Walken and how incredible that was. And she was really like the main actor in the cast that, you know, worked with him the most. And of course having scenes one-on-one -on -one. and, um, I, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing more of their dynamic. And she says, you know, she's clearly like, there is love between them. You know, like she loves her father. And, um, you know, we know that from the novel, um, that she cares about her father and, and views him a certain way, but. Um, you know, it's not, it's, I think as she says, not all rainbows and butterflies, like it's, it, it's a lot of weight on them and pressure and, um, Christopher Walken and, and how they're going to work out together. And, and uh, I think it's gonna be really cool to see as well. So again, if that, that clip is anything to go off of, I think, um, that could be one of the, maybe my favorite parts of the movie. And even though it's gonna be a, a much smaller, you know, by comparison, um, but yeah, I, I think that your is going to offer a lot that maybe fans of the book um that just know that her in that capacity are, aren't really expecting Denny was like be in this movie you're it's not going to be like a huge role but just wait part three. <laughs> uh, so part three is still there it's still just popping up every every chance he can create he, he played he played his uh, same card he played with zendaya for yeah. part one so yeah. that's good it's funny because reading the article you can tell they really want to talk about messiah and I feel like there's hints that we're going to get in the movie for Messiah. 
but they just have to officially green light it because why would Denis be writing a script? That's my question. Why would there be a script that's getting made right now if they're like, oh, we don't know if, if we're going to make part three. So, but back to uh, Florence Pugh, I, I, I love Midsummer. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, I know Marcus hasn't seen it. Rachel, have you seen it? Mm -hmm. Haven't seen it yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, Not so, so <laughs> what did you say, Johnny? I said, Marcus, gotta watch it. <clears throat> you do. And it's the movie that made me go, wait, she would be perfect for Erlon. And I love that we're expanding her character. And that scene with Chris Walken is just so great. It's, it, it just needs more cowbells and maybe even. <laughs> I didn't want to do it, but as soon as I started talking, I was like, it's clear. You know, it's they, they talk about the, like the, the, you know, they're, they're teasing that ending scene, right? Where everyone's together right. and they're like, everyone's just gathered there for two weeks filming while the biggest actors of our day are just standing around <laughs> and <laughs> everyone did it. They just stood around, even though they had no <laughs> lines and like, yeah, that's right. That's, that's what, when Diddy calls you, you show up because it's going to yep. be fun. But I think the, the relationship between the Emperor and Erlon is going to be something interesting to see. And I feel like maybe it's just me again, you know, crazy theory. I feel like the Emperor is like not dying, but just done. And it wants to pass it on to Erlon. That's maybe why he's taking her like on these missions. What do you think about all this and that? And I think he's just at an age where he's like, I'm done, you know, and that's going to give Erlon a bigger role. And like I said on the previous show, if we just go from the Erlon that we know from the 84 Lynch movie, where she has her voiceover, the beginning is a very delicate time. <laughs> and then we see her show up a couple of times at the end with no dialogue. How do we get that Erlon to badass, like spying? like being kind of tricky Erlon in Messiah. So I'm glad that Denis is evolving this Erlon that when we do get Messiah, we'll be like, well, makes sense. She's always been yeah. that character, not just yeah. a puppet. Because a lot yeah, of times- It's not retconning. She's just been developed in that way. Yeah. 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 And a lot of times we see memes of Erlon just on like the internet, just like kind of making fun of her and you feel bad <laughs> in a way, but that's all we know for she's 40 plus years in film that Erlon is just a puppet for Paul. So I, I wonder what she's going to think of the wedding. Also, if she's going to pose it or if maybe Shaddam tells her, you got to do this to keep our bloodline going. It's going to be interesting. Well, that, like, that line where she's like, you've been preparing me for this my whole life. I feel like that is very related to that scene. Um, mm -hmm. So clearly she's going into, she I knows. think she knows. She's going into it with her eyes fully open. Yeah. I, the last like 20, 30 minutes, I'm, I'm not even counting like the fight with Faye. Sure, that's, that's going to be insane. But I want to see how all those Mo like those chess pieces move. That's what I'm curious about. And speaking of stabbing someone with a knife, you know who would be great at that? A little child. That's all I'm saying. My hero, my idol, my reason for being. <laughs> Dude, come on. If we can make Chucky a thin, we can make Erlon. You, I mean, you think I'm joking, but like Alia has been a character that I have related to very hard for my entire life. I don't know what that says about me, but I've, just, <laughs> I've always loved, I could go on and on and on about what I think she does in the story and how she functions as like a consequence. Um, and also as a, as, as a female character in science fiction novels. But she, if she's not in it, I will be very, 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 very sad. If she's a talking zygote, that would be great. Um, <laughs> if she doesn't get to stabby stab then what are we doing okay that's my favorite part if it makes you feel any better Rachel 
whatever happens in, in part two, which we don't really know what's going to happen in part two, I feel I just really strongly get the vibe. Like as much as what as uh, Villeneuve is doing for Chani and like Yurilan right now and Lady Jessica, I, I think he is going to deliver on that front. Yeah, it would be weird. In this movie, the next movie, yeah. whatever it looks like, I think. Hopefully it'll it'll be okay. <laughs> but he gets everyone else right, and then he's like, "But this kid, I don't I don't get what she does when it's to her point." I just don't believe that with him. Yeah, I kind of want to go on the rabbit hole and search for spoilers from people that have seen it. <laughs> no, if, I if have. She don't do it. It's like blocking right I know. from my computer. <laughs> there on social media right now that there, there is definitely a risk of spoilers. So if you if you're trying to like keep that surprise, then I would definitely. <laughs> Definitely uh, be caught, uh, proceed with caution. <laughs> hey, speaking of spoilers, did anyone see the Josh Brolin interview when he asks uh, the reporter, what do you think of Duncan Idaho coming back for part three? Oh, no, I haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll send it to you later. And like Tim and Austin just jump him and being like, shh, what are you don't talk so He's like, I don't have anything to talk about. They, I've talked about my Balasset like 50 times. Yes. I'm going to drop <laughs> days. Yeah, the, I did article. like that, though, that little part of the article where, like, where they were like, oh, yeah, Josh and, and Zimmer went and like cooked something up that's, that's going to be up the sun. Cool. So I think that yeah, we've, we've covered a lot of what was in the total film article. As mentioned, a lot of uh, interviews still ahead that we're going to cover on the upcoming shows as well. But uh, yeah, if there's something that you want us to see focus on or a specific question, uh, feel free to message us uh, in the comments or on, uh, on social media. Uh, so for today, let's go ahead and sign off. Simon Dowdy here. You can find me at S. Dowdy on all the socials. Thank you for everyone that watches, listens, uh, just interacts with us. And I know we should say this more often, but please give us a like on YouTube if you're watching it or, you know, write us a, a review on your favorite podcast catcher if you're listening to the audible version of this podcast two more weeks such a long time i'm rachel you can find me on instagram at darth underscore rachel where i make a lot of dune cosplay uh thank you again for having me it's been really fun to talk about dune with other people that know dune uh i don't have that outlet uh in my podcasting life we talk about robin hobb uh, but it, it's been it's been really great. So thanks. Absolutely. Great to have Rachel on as always. And uh, thank you all for joining us again. Uh, it's just such an exciting time. I love geeking out over this stuff. There's gonna be a lot more of that to come. So stay tuned. You can find me on social media at Johnny Sobchak. And I uh, appreciate you taking the time to watch. And yeah, this is uh, Marcus Gabriel. You can find me at Marcus's writing and uh, doing a lot of stuff on dunesnet.com. Uh, and as uh, yeah, as have been teased, uh, you're going to see a lot more Dune Talk episodes in these last couple of weeks before the movie comes out. Until the next one, take care. We hope you've enjoyed Dune Talk. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you know when the next episode drops. Stay tuned to DuneNewsNet.com and add us to your social feeds. Be the first to hear breaking news and reviews.